making it and thanks for making it in the graveyard shift. Um, we'll try to be as entertaining as possible so you don't snooze immediately away, but as I say, thank you for making it. Uh, my name is Dirk Pilat, I'm a GP in Essex um, and at night I work for the RCGP um, as the uh, clinical director for e-learning. My friend here is Damien Bardija. He's the senior web developer in our team um, at the RCGP. And what we do is we create content for continuous professional development for general practitioners. Uh, why do we have to um, produce any content for G CPD for GPs? Well, it's one of my favorite slides. The estimated time for doubling of biomedical knowledge in years. So, a GP who qualified um, in 1950 had about 50 years until um, the amount of biomedical science doubled. And as you can see, that has come down a little bit. So by 2020, it's supposed to be only a fifth of a year. So with other words, if you see a young GP who's just qualified a few months ago, he's already out of date. Um, so we need something that will help GPs to stay up to date. And that's where um, we come in. As you probably heard, UK general practice has a little bit of a workforce crisis. Um, there's now 42,000 general practitioners in England. Um, more than a third will retire in the next five years. 50% um, of junior doctors after two years leave the profession. Um, very few people want to be general practitioners, so the few that are left of us uh, really be up to date because the few, the few that are left will be seeing all of you in primary care. Um, to stay up to date, um, there is a, um, re a an appraisal and a revalidation system. We have to uh, deliver about 50 hours of continuous professional development per year. Once a year we're being appraised by um, the CPD that we've done and with the, all the uh, practice-based incentives by an appraiser. And after five years, everything is put together, shaken, being seen by a, um, by a panel, and then decide whether we are allowed to practice another five years or not. Why us? Well, we are the professional membership body for GPs. If you want to be GP, you have to pass our exams. Um, after passing the exams, we still look after um, the membership and we make sure that um, CPD is being based on the curriculum um, that every few years is being adapted to current needs. We have 53,000 members in the UK. Uh, we're providing free online CPD for all of them and um, our funding model allows us to provide um, free CPD for pretty much every other uh, health professional in the UK. Um, we currently have 97,000 registered learners. A few months later we probably would have finally passed the 100,000 hurdle but it's um, 97,000 at the moment. So for the technical bits, Damien. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, at, at Moodle, well, I suppose we'll just take a, a little step back. We've been using Moodle since 2009. Uh, the real sort of like reason for choosing it. Um, I can't actually say why, as I wasn't working there, but Dirk, Dirk was involved in that decision, and it was, it was because it was open source. There was, there was no sort of upfront cost with any sort of licensing. And because of its bespoke nature, it really sort of like fitted the business needs of the college at that time to sort of create content. Really why we still keep using it is, is because it works. It works for us, it, it works for other organizations and institutions. <coughs> actually the infrastructure, how, how we actually do this, so how do we, how do we deliver this, this learning, this CPD to, to our users? Well, Relatively simple setup. I don't. I don't think it's anything out of the ordinary. We have two virtual web, uh, two virtual servers, uh, a web server and a database server, running on Oracle Linux, and a regular sort of uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP stack. We're currently on Moodle 3.1 version. Um, we chose that with the with the long-term release um, support option. Now within our actual organization, within the RCGP, we have other systems. There's, we have a membership system, so Dirk mentioned our members, so we have various bits of information about those members, which we hold somewhere else. We have our, our, our college website, um, that's used as a sort of point of contact for, for our members, but also if people wish to 
update their details, if they wish to purchase courses, that's the system we use. We have a single sign-on system, we have some API servers which sort of link it all together. Um, CPD was mentioned, so we have an external e-portfolio system as well, which is also linked to, which allows all the, all the learning items that have been uh, taken by the doctors to export them to that portfolio. I suppose one of the main sort of important things with, with this landscape, and I say we, we join it all up, I wouldn't say we do it any better than any other organisation, we always have lots of work to do, but the main thing is we do it because we want to tr really try and ensure that uh, our users, our members have as, I suppose, as a seamless experience as possible. We want to make their, their experience with us simple and also we want it to concentrate on the important aspect, which is the learning, rather on just sort of logging in or having to sort of then find another password for another system. So what do we actually sort of offer? Well, we've got 168 courses, and that's complemented with a, with a few other things, such as screencasts and blogs. The, the, the courses, they, they vary in size, in content. Uh, some of them are single topic in nature, others are multi-topic, and then we also have a, a self-assessment tool. The, the courses themselves are also very varied in size. We have one of our courses up to 20,000 users within it, but then equally another course only has six. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, very, it's a very wide sort of like coverage um, of, the, of the college curriculum, of the topics that the, the GPs need to undertake. So that's, that's sort of, you know, that's, that's what we offer. And how do we do that? So there's a few things on there. I'm not gonna talk through every single one of them. I, I think, things to sort of point out. We've got, we've got a standard 3.1 installation with 29 plugins. Of those 29 plugins, uh, we have one which is a standard plugin and that hasn't been uh, adulterated or hacked or anything to that. Uh, another six of those have are standard plugins from the, from the uh, Moodle library and they have had various sort of like additions made to them. And then the 22 remaining are all plugins or modifications that, that we have either sort of like commissioned or we have sort of done in house. On top of that, we have approximately 60 core files which we've made changes to and around about 300 changes. So it's something which is, we're aware that it, possibly isn't best practice. We know that it's a nightmare when it comes to upgrading. It's an immense nightmare and, and as time goes by it's something that which we're, we're trying to get to grips with. We're trying to sort of rein in a little bit um, but not always, not always easy when, when you have sort of business needs that just sort of slightly flow differently to how, how Moodle is operating. I think one of the, one of the interesting sort of like plugins I will mention there is we have a we have an enrollment plugin which allows for any of our users to self enroll in a course all of our courses are, are self governed there are no there are no sort of teachers or administrators on the course there's no one looking after the courses it's once that course is is set free into the wild then anyone can anyone can access it so we have a, a complex sort of matrix of of user type and membership level and location and so on which determine whether or not a user can actually access the course and if they if it's discovered they can't access the course we then point them off into a place where they can purchase the course so gps love reflection and as we should all in our learning so every course, and you can see a few little details there, um, has a different um, spectrum of content depending on the needs of that particular course. We have some which are literally only point and click, um, five, minutes, five minutes, ten minutes long because they're only supposed to hone one particular message that we really want um, our learners to take home with. Others are um, between 30 and 60 minutes long, some are 50 minutes long. We have pre and post assessment quizzes to ascertain um, 
at least a little bit whether there is educational attainment or not. We have some interactive um, animations, uh, mainly storyline uh, and articulate files. And of course, very important for every GP, there needs to be a certificate, otherwise we can't prove our learning at the end to our appraisers. Um, by the way, the whole shebang is run with um, five full-time staff. Um, five full-time staff looking after 97,000 learners. We're quite proud of that. Um, there are a few, some of our GPs are contracted to help us, which you see now, because how do we do it? it takes a bit because as you can um, imagine, our unique selling point is that we're the RCGP and the content they create should really we hold up to our brand image, which is we provide learning for GPs. There shouldn't really be any factual mistakes in our content. So we have a few Q&A levels, as you can imagine. So if we, if we come up with a topic and we have partners we um, create the content with, we convene a scoping panel. So we have a few cold face GPs, we have a few specialists, patient um, associates, um, people who just have an interest, and we come together either physically or, around, or virtually and to try over 30 minutes or an hour to, hack, to hammer out the particular content. We create a document on that, um, on that discussion, distribute that to every stakeholder. <coughs> content additions are being made, critics, um, criticism is being made, and then once that scoping document is, is done, we hand it to a GP who is authoring it together with one of our editors. Um, first draft is again hand over to the, to the peer review panel. Critician, criticians, uh, critics, um, uh, can come in and criticism is being made, comments are being made, uh, which are being um, um, in, um, imported into the document. We hand it over to our um, instructive designer who builds it. Again, we ask everybody um, from the um, scoping panel to have a look at the course. Again, look for factual um, mistakes, which by that point hopefully are not in there anymore, but see how the flow is, how the um, um, how the um, articulate story files look on it, whether it's appropriate pictures. Um, again, we, we change the whole thing around if necessary. Final QA is by me. Again, look for factual mistakes, look for any, any, um, any suggestion within the content, core content that might be construed negatively, and then we'll soft launch it. And um, once it seems to be okay, the um, communication machinery of, of the college and um, our partners um, um, informs our member that it's there. Um, we update it every two years, which at, at 168 courses with a small course staff is getting a little bit complicated, but we still seem to be okay with it. Um, feedback, there's a mix of qualitative quantitative. We have the five-star um, rating. We have a user comments. Um, GPs, as you can imagine, are very happy to, to critique. Um, so every course has, the, for every user, has the immediate opportunity to do free text, um, qualitative feedback and quantitative feedback, which we then um, use to learn from and hopefully within the course um, iron out any, any niggles. Yay, nice and damn nice. Um, yes, so, well, you can see it there. We, we don't like data, we love it. Uh, we, we, we really do like our data at the RCGP. Um, Dirk sort of already mentioned the feedback. It's, I mean, one of the ways we use feedback is, I mean, that there's numerous ways we, we use the, we give the, the that, that sort of like five-star Amazon-esque rating. We, we use that sort of like internally in reports. It's a very sort of like quick way to see how a course is performing. We use the actual comments themselves. Uh, we use them as a, we publish them on the site as a as a testimonial, which allow. Speak a little bit louder, yep, certainly. How's that? Is that? I'm tall, so I'm a little bit further. <laughs> so um, we, yeah, we, we we publish the the testimonials, and that gives other users of the site an opportunity to get to get a very sort of like quick synopsis of of the content of course and help sort of like guide new users as, the, as, a, as to the type of course they could take. We also use that feedback to provide to our sort of external partners, which they use to sort of publish to their users, and that then, that brings more users to our site. We then become a more attractive um, proposition for 
having additional partnerships with other organizations, which then creates more users. So that's a, it's sort of like a, a self a self feeding system. That, that's the sort of like feedback. The actual sort of other sort of like main part of the statistics that we use. Uh, we have a, a sort of like an RCGP layer, almost sort of like a business intelligence layer, over the top of, of the regular Moodle statistics. We we link to that membership system, and we really try and sort of like find out what our users are doing. Uh, I know that doesn't sound much different, to, I'm sure many of you, but we we wish to know sort of. Uh, how our users are, are meeting sort of the criteria that we set, and that they're very much set on what activity there is within a course and what type of completion or the, or the number of completions within courses. And by sort of measuring the sort of completion rates and the activity within a course or the, or the number of logins, and we mixing that up with the uh, membership data, we're able to sort of ascertain how many GPs in training, for example, are accessing content in, in like uh, the Northwest faculty or, or northern region of the UK. And that then used in combination with particular some of the, the, the stats from Google allows us to understand whether sort of like marketing campaigns sort of targeted at specific sets of our users and our members um, is actually sort of like getting a return of investment for any of that given content. Quick one on success. Um, education attainment measured um, in pre and post quizzes. Number of um, users um, telling us how, how attractive the course is, um, which varies between um, um, certain curriculum um, items. So for some weird reason, some curriculum, um, core curriculum parts are less attractive than other ones. Resp for some weird reason, respiratory medicine always seems to be um, getting the most, the most hits. Um, we have the quality of feedback, and fortunately, over the last um, four years, we've won uh, two um, learning technology awards, which was great as a reassure, uh, reassuring uh, measure of our peers in the, in the industry. And almost done. Bent forward. So, um, what, what's next? Well, I mentioned a little bit ago the landscape so we have our membership system, um, it's all changing. So as we speak, we're, lots of systems at the college are being, are being changed. We're actually changing to Salesforce for our, um, our membership database. So there's lots of new integrations to be had there. Uh, GDPR has been mentioned. It's something which we've had lots of workshops with, with solicitors and we hope we're working towards being compliant, but there's certainly a lot more work to do we will more than likely be going to a, a 3.5 upgrade in the near future once it's released. I say near future, it'll be released in a, in a month or so's time. Realistically, something like that for us will probably happen in the autumn. Um, and we hope to sort of really sort of like exploit some of the sort of the GTPR functionality from that. And then we'll be having more courses. There'll be more courses, more clinical content, more, more users with that, and then of course more data from that. Thank you.